Thank you, Peter. So if this is the day after the apocalypse with a road. <laughs> Okay, so by way of introduction, before we get into the main bit, um, I'm Tom Abbott. I'm an Associate Professor in Art and Design at the University of the West of England in Bristol in the UK. I'm also a director of the Artist Collective Circumstance, and Circumstance work with the narrative of experience, the politics of public space, sound, and mobile technology. We say we wrap our questions in melancholy and romance, and I'm, con I'm contractually obligated to point out we don't do jokes. Um, but here's Kate Pollinger. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, and I'm, I'm Kate Pullinger. Um, I'm a fiction writer, and I've been working in the realm of di fiction and digital, digital media for, for quite a while now. I also teach at a university called Bath Spa in the UK, although unlike Tom, I'm a Canadian, uh, but we live and work in the UK. Um, and at, uh, at Bath Spa, I have a cohort of PhD students who are all doing digital writing uh, projects of, of uh, many, different, many different types. I just also wanted to mention our uh, online magazine that Donna Hancocks, who spoke yesterday, and I, she's at QUT in Australia, uh, and I uh, at Bath Spa co-edit, which is called The Writing Platform. It's just thewritingplatform.com. And this website uh, focuses on where writing, in particular creative writing, whether that's fiction or creative nonfiction, meets technology. So uh, ha if you have time, have a look. And if you've got anything that you'd like to write for us about the site, please get in touch. We have a small commissioning budget. So anyway, on to ambient literature. Um, <clears throat> It's really terrific to be back at, uh, at Books at Browsers, speaking to the, the theme of telling small stories, which I feel is a, a theme I've been working on for almost my entire life. Uh, this is the third time I've been to Books and Browsers. I missed, I missed the last one, but it's very, very interesting to see how the conversation has changed uh, from the previous, previous iterations of the conference to what's going on here now. But it remains my favorite uh, conference in, in the world. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here with Tom. And uh, Tom's going to kick off our discussion of, of ambient literature now. OK. Imagine you're standing alone in a green space not far from here. The phone in your hand displays a map of the surrounding area. But instead of Google's places of interest, gray blocks and traffic alerts, a set of zones are visible. Just distance is indicated, distance and direction. As the music and narration dies away, a voice in your ear asks you to nominate the next zone. You'll need to proceed 60 yards to the southwest and select a spot. You begin to walk, and on arriving, audio crackles into life as you confirm your location. Although you began this journey in Golden Gate Park, this isn't San Francisco. The sites you're mapping into the story correspond to events taking place in Jemeh El Fnar, the main square and market in Marrakesh. Already you've mapped the square. Medicine men with their cures and nostrums are to the northeast of where you're stood now. Fortune tellers under their umbrellas are to your right, and an acrobat is behind you. Your ears are bombarded with the dull roar of thousands of people. The sounds of music, shouting, even the smell of spiced Moroccan coffee is a palpable, if impossible, reality. In a few moments, the purpose of this story will reveal itself. This isn't only mapping, though. This is a laying out of evidence, a vantage points to witness, to participate in an unfolding narrative. What you're doing is building a memory palace within which you'll experience a piece of fiction. Sometime later, in another city, in another time zone, a reader selects your version of the Marrakesh map and is directed in reading mode, rather than your writing, around the ghost echoes you created. They, like you, were given the, chance, the choice to read or write at the start, and they decided to surrender control to another person, to read their version of the story. In 20 minutes, though, they'll discover they can't stand in the spot in which the story ends. Quite by accident, as their map unfolds, that site has been mapped onto a secured space patrolled by uniformed security guards. This reader will stand outside a story, looking in and unable to complete events. The world will have interrupted narrative, suspended it, and although our reader will be permitted to override the location setting and hear the final sections of the story, they might remember that they were denied a vital vantage point, that their distance from it has somehow reinforced the theme of the piece itself. The next time they walk past that spot, and all the times hence, they'll remember the names, the sounds, and the impossible sense an invisible story that hung over their city. I think we overuse cutting edge. I think we've devalued it. It's become a shorthand for shiny things that we forget about in a month. 
instead of telling you just how cool we are, we think that focusing on how we write and how we read offers more opportunities to change the world. The description I opened this talk with is taken from Duncan Speakman's as yet untitled commission for ambient literature. It's about preserving spaces that are, yet, are, about, that are about to disappear or change forever. And as our abstract suggests, it responds to the presence of a reader to deliver a situated liter literary experience through a pervasive computing platform, a phone, in other words. We're six months into a two-year project, and Kate Pullinger and I are here to talk about the project and explain what we're doing. So, um, far away from the sturm and drang of the publishing industry, the boardrooms of the big five and their colossal outrider, Amazon, a quiet revolution is taking place. And I think it's exactly the kind of thing that we're hearing about here yesterday and today. It's a revolution of form and content with many shapes and names and in, an increasing number of readers and viewers. A little, a little over a year ago in the UK, uh, a group of innovators based at the Pervasive Media Studio, which is in Bristol, were nearing the end of React, a four-year project. They asked themselves, what next? React had led the interdisciplinary team to think hard about the relationship between text, book, digital platform, and the reader. They felt that some of the most interesting projects that arose out of the books and print sandbox were those that also interrogated the relationship between story and the urban landscape, using technology to place the reader inside the landscape of the story. At the same time, I continued to develop my own practice as a novelist and digital writer with collaborative projects like Inanimate Alice with Chris Joseph and Andy Campbell. We launched episode six, The Last Gas Station, earlier this year also through flight paths and landing gear, which I talked about at Books and Browsers in 2013. And then a, a large digital war memorial project called Letter to an Unknown Soldier, for which in 2014, nearly 22,000 people wrote letters to the unknown soldier to mark the centenary of the outbreak of World War I. I'd gone from being a freelance writer to working for Bath Spa University and had my eye on the pervasive media studio, which was just one more stop down the great Western train line, as a center for all things digital and experimental. The first time I visited the studio, I met a man who'd figured out a way to send love letters to the moon. So when I asked if I'd be interested in, so when they asked if I'd be interested in coming on board for a new research project that took what they'd learned from React in order to think further about what shape future books might take, I tried and probably failed not to look too overexcited. A research grant application was written and awarded worth about 1.2 million US in the old money, that's pre-Brexit money, and an interdisciplinary team of scholars was assembled across the University of the West of England, Bath Spa, where I work, and the University of Birmingham. The writer James Attlee, who worked on the Writer on the Train project, one of the REACT experiments. The writer-artist Duncan Speakman, who Tom mentioned earlier, who works with him in circumstance. And our technical team, the Bristol-based developers Calvium, were brought on board. Over the next two years, we will take a scholarly look at the field, scoping the potential for what we're calling ambient literature, a term that owes a lot to um, Malcolm McCullough's uh, book, Ambient Commons, and, and, and other work that other scholars have done. We're thinking carefully about what the word literature means in an era of ubiquitous computing, and we're thinking hard about the place of text, the uses of text in storytelling that relies on pervasive media. James Attlee, Duncan Speakman, and I will each make a new work creative pieces that will hopefully demonstrate and amplify the ideas we're exploring through our scholarly research in this emerging field. Okay, it's, it's difficult, and I think not to say a little dangerous, to absolutely define a research field at the outset of a project. We're interested in what we're not as much as what we are, although, as Kate's pointing out, literature is critically important. And by way of context, it's worth pointing out that since its inception in 2008, the Pervasive Media Studio has championed the delightful, the crazy, the opportune, and the beautiful experiences that explore what technology can do to the world around us. One of the studio's mantras in its early days was a desire to invent a better future than that frequently proposed in corporate presentations of smart technologies and interactive books, to invent a future that had people at its heart rather than just interfaces and screens. 
And since 2008, we've seen street games become businesses, new forms of musical instrument go from cardboard prototypes to manufactured lines of product. And all that time, I've been acutely aware of the potential of the stories we told about those projects. In 2013, I made a book called These Pages Fall Like Ash. It comprised a wood-bound pair of gazetteers with a digital layer of story hidden across the whole city, and it was kind of wonderful. In collaboration with Neil Gaiman and Nick Harkaway, we told a story about an imaginary city existing alongside your own. The voice of a woman and her child from that city seeping into your own reality in search of something she'd lost and had almost forgotten. What was especially glorious about writing these pages was that I knew where our readers would be, specifically, down to the square foot. If we delivered a fragment of narrative to a street that overlooked the whole city, I could be reasonably certain I knew what they were looking at, too. And it was that degree of personalization, of working with attention in a very specific way that was the trigger for our journey toward ambient literature. The phone in your pocket is capable of interpreting data from a wide variety of sources. It knows how it's being held, whether it's being moved, and how quickly. It can hear noise, it can recognize your face, and of course, it can lie to you. Culturally, I think our acceptance of a new medium comes in fits and starts. Location aware storytelling has been present in a variety of forms for some time. Eli Horowitz and Russell Quinn's The Silent History is possibly the best known example of long form situated digital storytelling, but smaller, more personal experiments have been made by Daniel Belasco Rogers and Sophia New working as Plan B in Berlin, Mine and Duncan's company Circumstance, and Blast Theory working in, Bright in Brighton. What ambient literature represents, though, to us are two years to really get under the skin of the field, to explore and define and develop with some certainty of time and a little money. Yes, yeah, so as you can probably tell, we're really we're at the beginning of this project. This is why we have one slide and nothing else to show you. Um, so for my own commission for the project, I plan to write a ghost story to be experienced in a bedroom in a city, any bedroom in any city. I'm going to use binaural sound and fake augmented reality, or maybe real augmented reality, or maybe fake real augmented reality, in order to haunt my readers, in order to alter their perception of the familiar space, their room in which they are reading. I'm going to try to capitalize on the complex and intimate relationships many of us have developed with our smartphones, and how we use our phones when we're by ourselves, reading. Sleep experts tell us not to read on our phones in bed, but I suspect that this is advice that many of us ignore, myself included. I'm also thinking about the difference between public space and private space and how the reader's gender might influence their perception of the urban landscape. For instance, how it might affect their ability to interact with a story embedded in the urban landscape. So I'll set the story in a room, your room. I've been thinking about writing for smartphones for a while now, writing fiction that's native to the smartphone, that uses the affordances of the phone, the sensors, the accelerometer, the camera, the microphone, etc. As well as working on my ambient literature story, I'm also working on a commission with a German startup called Ulipo, who are launching a smartphone platform for serialized, media-rich stories at the end of this year. For me, 2017 is going to be the year when forms native to the smartphone come of age. The idea of a smartphone as a container for stories, indeed the idea of the book, ebook, app, or website as, as types of containers for stories also interests me. It's what Dave Kramer touch touched on yesterday. Ten years ago, the idea of book as an analog container, an ebook as a digital container, was useful, and indeed the subject of containers is one that featured in talks at books and browsers in the past. But more recently, that particular word of the use, use of the word container seems to have fallen away. Now, as many, most, perhaps, internet users move away from the open web toward closed platforms or walled gardens, um, for example, as dictated or driven by Facebook, do we need containers more or less than in the past? If a container is defined as broadly as stone tablet, human storyteller, book, or app, do stories in containers conflict with our developing ideas around ambient literature? Does thinking about thresholds and boundaries in storytelling conflict with our ideas about the borderless, unbounded stories afforded by pervasive media? 
What can thinking about ambient literature tell us about storytelling both within a walled garden and on the open web? Or, at the risk of sounding very pretentious indeed, is the desire for bounded containers in fact part of what drives us to tell stories that have a beginning, a middle, and an end, like life itself? Can we be post-container? Can we be post-locative? Are we indeed post-digital? So here's a bit of what we're going to do. Uh, Duncan Speakman's project will be our first release in May 2017, with James Attlee's launching at the Biannual Conference on Creative Writing and Technology at Baspa University, MIX, in July 2017. And um, there's a call for papers for that conference circulating now, which I'll, I'll tweet out later today. And my project will be, be released last of all at the end of 2017, which means I get to learn from everyone else's mistakes. All these commissions are all funded by academic research grant money. We'll have an ongoing dialogue with the publishing industry throughout the project, and we've pulled together an advisory board drawn from the UK trade publishing mainstream, including representatives from the big five. My experience is that mainstream publishing isn't all that interested in this kind of literary work, but it's our opinion that through this project and others like it, we're doing the kind of research and development work for which publishers simply don't have the time and resources, and we're hoping they'll find engaging with ambient literature useful. We're also, and this kind of plays to the discussion at the end of yesterday, we're developing a toolkit. This is, as Kate said, a publicly funded program of work, and we want as much, of it to be po as much of it as possible to be open to anyone to play with. As is typical for an academic project, there'll also be a co-author text of empty thousand densely chosen words published at the end, but we want to write a how to design ambient literature guide aimed at writers and developers who want to work in this space. To facilitate that, we're making a set of smaller experiments around the ages of the three main commissions. Each one of these will address a research question, essentially becoming a how, do you can, how can you do this project? And the next of these, called Yesterday You're Still Dreaming, premieres in Bristol next weekend. And the plan for this is to see if it's possible to make an audience believe that it's a day ago. So, by way of context, when you're reading a conventional book, you're in the here and now. I mean, actually, you're not. You're a kind of nanosecond away from the here and now because your brain is making that moment for you. But you're present in the world. And with Yesterday You're Still Dreaming, I want to tr try and spe suspend disbelief by means of audio, text, and voice such that each reader leaves with a nagging sense that they did in fact stand in the same spot 24 hours before. And for some reason, which the piece explores, their mind has refused to correlate that fact. But for now though, that's us. Um, and before we go, we'd like to leave you with a thought about why we're doing this, and possibly about why we all might be here today. We firmly believe that the point of digital literature is to tell a story in ways that a conventional text cannot. To search for the ways in which technology, and let's not forget the book itself is a technology, guides us to tell stories that are at once new and old, novel and familiar, to be relevant to who we are today. Thank you very much.